Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, our first Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. My name is Susanna Doyle, and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager here at Trinity Development and Alumni. Uh, at TDA, building and maintaining a community for our alumni and friends has always been paramount to uh, the work that we do. And we've traditionally done this through uh, welcoming you at events that we run here in Dublin on campus, as well as around the world through our international chapters. And we really, really miss being able to welcome you uh, to these different events that we would have normally been running, uh, where we would have the opportunity to connect with all of you, see you reconnecting and networking, um, and having opportunities to continue learning. And so in the absence of being able to run these live events, we still wanted you to know that we're here to support you and that the Trinity community is still uh, here and very strong. And as such, we have started this Inspiring Ideas at webinar uh, series this evening. Uh, before we go through um, in the introduction of our speaker, I just wanted to say that every week we have um, we will have speakers from across the Trinity spectrum speaking with you um, on various topics on managing stress, on ethical issues in healthcare, um, and uh, within treating COVID-19 patients, adjusting to a new professional landscape. Um, the speakers all come from across the Trinity spectrum. They'll be alumni, they'll be friends, they'll be professors. So we're really excited to kick off uh, this webinar series and to ensure that, especially during this time of social isolation, you feel supported by the Trinity community. Uh, before I introduce our first uh, speaker for this evening, um, I just wanted to quickly go through a couple of uh, technical uh, pieces with you, as well as um, what the format for the evening is going to be. Um, if you are listening in tonight on Zoom and are unfamiliar with some of the functionality of it, um, if you need to go into full screen, you can do that on the top right of your screen. You can press the button there. If you need to adjust your audio settings, you can do that on the bottom left of your screen. If you need to leave the meeting, you can do that on the bottom right of your screen. And if you'd like to ask any questions, you're very welcome to do so by pressing the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the presentation tonight, uh, the speaker will answer those questions. For those of you who are listening in on Facebook Live, uh, you can also ask questions which the speaker uh, will be able to answer as well. If for whatever reason you have any problems uh, with uh, internet connectivity or you're dropping out, uh, we will be recording the session. So you'll, be, uh, you'll have the opportunity to listen at a later time. Uh, the format for this evening, uh, our speaker is going to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, after which we'll go into the Q&A and we hope to finish up by about 8.30 tonight. So now I'd really like to introduce our first ever speaker to the Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar, uh, Dr. Sabina Brennan. She is an alumna of Trinity. She completed her PhD in the Institute of Neuroscience at Trinity and she specializes in brain health. She has very kindly asked us to be uh, her guinea, uh, to be, she's very kindly agreed to be our guinea pig for this evening. Um, I first had the opportunity to see Sabina speak a couple of months ago at a Trinity Women's Group uh, presentation where she spoke about uh, aging, and I was really moved by her presentation. And so when we were going to launch this webinar series, we thought she would be an excellent first speaker, and tonight she will be speaking to all of you about boosting brain health during uh, COVID-19. So I'm now gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Sabina. Hello, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming along um, to watch me being the guinea pig um, on this talk. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I so wish I could see you. Uh, one thing I miss most about uh, you know, the, the lockdown actually is uh, giving my talks and it's not so much the giving it's actually the receiving and, and seeing people's faces so while I'm getting to speak this evening um, I'm not getting to see you but I hope that you would you know comment on Facebook live or follow me on my social media etc and let me know what countries you've listened in from what you thought of the talk any suggestions that you might have I would absolutely love to hear um, 
My uh, next job is I'm going to share a screen and um, you'll see the slides from my presentation and then you'll see me either along the side, across the top, you can move me around or you can hide my face if you want and just look at the, uh, look at the slides. So bear with me just for a moment while I get my slides up um, and I'll just go full screen there and there we go. Right, so um, yes. Um, as Susanna said, I'm a psychologist and a neuroscientist, and uh, my area of interest is uh, brain health. Um, and usually, actually, when I give this talk, um, I start by saying to my audience, you know, hands up if you brushed your teeth this morning. So I'm going to pretend that you've all put your hands up. And then I say, keep your hands up if you intend brushing your teeth again this evening. And pretty much all the hands stay up again. Some very honest folk take their hands down. Um, so we have a full house of, of, of people saying, yes, they brushed their teeth this morning. And then I say, leave your hands up if you consciously, and consciously being the operative word, um, uh, did something for your brain health today. And pretty much the majority of the people um, let their hands drop. Um, often it's about you know 98% or whatever, which is kind of pretty crazy when you think about it. Um, uh, you know, we talk about physical health, and thankfully we talk about mental health. Um, we talk about dental health and heart health, and, and yet nobody seemed to be talking about brain health, and that seemed kind of crazy to me. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Dental health is super important because you need your teeth to eat, to speak, and to smile, but you need your brain for everything. There isn't one thing that you can do without your brain. So brain health matters, but the thing is, I mean, obviously a lot of you uh, listening in are Trinity um, alumni, but um, uh, the thing is you are obviously very smart kids because what age are we when we learn to brush our teeth? It's a, a very, very young. And, and essentially what you're learning um, is about a very complex concept called investment. Time spent now engaging in a particular daily activity reaps future benefits. And those benefits are that you get to hold on to your teeth for as long as possible. Then you come to, to learn that if you engage in additional activities like uh, flossing, visiting your dentist regularly, or avoiding sugary drinks, you'll do even better and you'll minimize the amount of pain or fillings that you'll have to have. And then when you become an adult, you come to realize that even if you fastidiously followed your dentist's advice, um, it doesn't come with an absolute guarantee. You know, hit my age and you may have a crumbling tooth or two or you may need some work or some fillings, but you know that you're in a far, far better position than you would have been if you didn't brush your teeth every day. Well, the same applies to brain health. We now know that there are things that you can do each and every day that increase the likelihood that you can hold on to important functions like memory in later life. Um, now, just like dental health, it doesn't come with an absolute guarantee, but we know that you'd be in a far, far better position than you wouldn't have, would have been if you didn't engage in a brain healthy uh, life. Now, the thing is your brain is constantly changing. And it's your behaviors, your experiences, and the lifestyle choices that you make that shape it. And the good news is that, that that's at any age. What we do, and actually just as importantly, what you don't do, influences how resilient your brain can be in the face of challenge. And that challenge can take the form of aging, injury, and disease. And at the moment, the challenge we're facing really is, you know, the coronavirus, COVID-19. So I like to think about adopting a brain healthy lifestyle as investing in brain capital that not only optimizes your brain function in the here and now, but allows you to build reserves that you can cash in at some point in the future to compensate for disease, damage, or decline. Now, that disease can be, you know, multiple sclerosis, uh, the, you know, the damage could be as, as a consequence of a stroke, the decline could be related with aging. But the disease that we talk about most, talk about brain health most, um, is in the context um, of uh, dementia. So I'm just going to talk about that very briefly. Um, and that is um, that dementia currently globally, there's about 50 million people affected by 
living with dementia. Um, and that figure, unfortunately, is set to treble by 2050. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and that affects about 34 million people. And any of the research or information that I share throughout this talk refers really to Alzheimer's disease because that's where the, the major bar, you know, the majority of the research has been carried out. Now, at the moment, one in three children born now will go on to develop dementia if we find no cure. And at the moment, there is no cure. And even if there is, a, a cure is forthcoming, um, it will likely need to be something that will work in conjunction with lifestyle change, as much as uh, a lot of heart interventions do. You know, um, we have cholesterol-lowering medication, but you also need to engage in um, lifestyle changes as well to lower your cholesterol. So it's very simple. But because we've no cure, at the moment, prevention is key. And there is some good news in that regard because we know that 30% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease are attributable to just seven modifiable risk factors. So things that you can do something about. Now, age is the single biggest risk factor. Um, but what I'm interested in is the modifiable risk factors, the things that you and I can do something about to minimize our risk of developing dementia. Um, so what I'm quoting here from is a paper in the Lancet Neurology that, that um, looked at these seven uh, modifiable risk factors. And they are type 2 diabetes, midlife high blood pressure, midlife obesity, and smoking. They're the first four. And rather interestingly, they are also um, risk factors for COVID-19. So people living with those are at increased risk of developing COVID-19 also. The other factors include physical inactivity and low levels of mental stimulation and low levels of education. Depression is also um, a risk factor. And again, I think that they are also things that are going to be very challenging for us in terms of COVID-19 and the measures in place, such as you know, the social isolation, it's more, more difficult for us to be physically active and similarly you know, to maintain mental stimulation and to avoid becoming depressed. So brain health is critical for anybody with a brain at any point in, in life, but even more so while we're living under these current restrictions with COVID-19. Now, there are the seven factors that were published in this particular paper in The Lancet. There's two other factors that I want to, to mention because the risk associated with these in terms of developing dementia are just as high as some of the other ones that I've mentioned already. And that is alcohol consumption and loneliness and social isolation. And again, those are things that are very relevant to um, the times that we're living at the moment because people are actually drinking more alcohol than they normally would. And also a lot of people are at you know, very, very severe risk of loneliness. And I will talk about that in more detail as I go through. What I want to do is with this talk is just introduce you to two uh, concepts, scientific concepts that underlie brain health. And then what I'm going to do is just give you some top tips uh, for brain health with a special emphasis on how we're living our life now, because it's very different to how I was living my life when, when I gave my last talk. Anyway, okay, I kind of hate this slide, but um, I show it to just show you the difference between a healthy brain and a brain that has been atrophied, that is shriveled from Alzheimer's disease. So it's not hard to see how someone with Alzheimer's disease, how their memory function and other cognitive functions um, will mal malfunction when the brain has shrink, um, has, has, has atrophied by that much. Now, you're probably familiar with thinking of your brain, you know, if someone says your brain, you know, this is what you think of. And I absolutely hate this image. I think it's part of the reason maybe, you know, why people don't consider their brain health. Um, I, I, I don't know, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty, pretty ugly um, uh, looking organ, I suppose. But um, for me, it doesn't reflect what your brain is really like. Your brain is the most dynamic, you know, it, it's the most exciting organ um, in your body. And, and this, these kind of images are, are what speak to me more about what the brain is actually like. So this is, these are actually images of neurons, brain cells from a mouse. 
So you've got 86 billion brain cells um, inside your head, and they are connected to each other um, by trillions of connections um, uh, that allow them to communicate with each other and with the rest of your body. And obviously your brain is the master controller, and that's why I'm passionate about us um, actually really looking after it so that we can optimize, and it's not only its function, but kind of reach our true potential in a way. This um, is a, a, an image from a human brain, and, and it actually gives much more of a sense to me of the dynamic nature of the brain, how it's vibrant and it's communicating. And those, those 86 billion cells are communicating each, with each other through electrical and chemical signals, doing amazing stuff. So when you think of the brain, I'd rather you think of this kind of thing, excuse me. <clears throat> and after um, this talk, you know, just Google Brainbow, and you'll see lots of amazing images of the brain that are much nicer than that beige, crinkly thing that we usually think of. Unfortunately, I have to go back to slices of the, the beige, crinkly thing to illustrate my next point. And that is that um, uh, these actually, I used to be dreadful when I gave my talks and I'd play spot the difference. And then I just felt so guilty. Everybody was trying to find the difference between these two slices of brain. And um, there is no difference. That's actually the point. They're clearly not slices from a healthy brain. Um, and basically, um, what, what I want to, to, to explain to you is that back in 1989, a researcher called Katzman was interested in finding out um, what was different in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease compared to individuals who did not have Alzheimer's disease. So he was looking at their brains of individuals from a nursing home who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. He was looking at their brains post-mortem. And then he had a control group also individuals in a nursing home, but these had no diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And he made an amazing discovery. He found that 10 cases of cognitively normal older adults, they had sufficient pathology in their brain for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but they had no symptoms whatsoever. So for some reason, they were resilient. And that sparked a whole area of research. And that's actually really how I got into this area. When I did my PhD, um, I started to read all about this resilience and, and, and also about the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And I started to say, how come I didn't know this? And how come nobody knows this? And because um, there'd been publications since 1989 about it. And that's why I've become passionate about translating the science and getting that information out to the general public, because it's very important empowering information. So what we've come, when, when it comes to science, it's the area of research that I work in, we call that resilience reserve. Okay, and it comes from the repeated obs observation by clinicians that there's no direct relationship between the degree of brain pathology or brain injury and the clinical manifestations of that disease or um, that injury, so the symptoms. There's no direct relationships. Two people could sustain a stroke of the same magnitude. One can have severe impairment and the other can have relatively minim minimal um, impairment. And, and so we call the difference there, this resilience, we describe it as reserve. And what, what, what we've come to realize is that this resilience that we call reserve is actually linked to lifestyle factors. And so that's where the good news is. So it's really about certain life choices that these individuals made allow them to build up this reserve that offers um, a, a form of protection um, when disease strikes or when they're challenged. Now, it's not a get out of jail free card. Um, uh, but what it does is it allows you to sustain more brain pathology for longer before you will develop symptoms. Ultimately, the symptoms will come. So what it actually is doing is changing the, direct, the, the trajectory of the disease. So you get more years in possession of your full faculties or your, your memory function, etc., uh, for longer, uh, which is good news. So what I want to do is actually just show you um, a little animation. I use animation and I've developed a lot of online resources and materials and I'll share a link to that. Superbrain.ie is my website at the bottom and you'll find all those free resources, links to them on the website. But I'm gonna play one of the little animations now. And I was gonna to say to, 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 to give you a break from my voice, but I do the voiceovers on the animation, so you're not getting any break. So. What is cognitive reserve? We all know people who are really resilient. People who keep on keeping on no matter what life throws at them. 
Well, our brain has the capacity for resilience too, provided we give it a helping hand by living a brain healthy lifestyle. For example, when a disease like multiple sclerosis strikes, it attacks brain and spinal cord tissue, causing communication problems within the central nervous system that can lead to physical, visual, or cognitive impairments. We know that some people with multiple sclerosis can tolerate more disease pathology than others while still retaining cognitive function. Scientists believe that their resilience in the face of disease pathology is linked to certain life exposures. Here's how they think it works. The brain has an inbuilt but finite resource called neurological reserve. This reserve allows the brain to retain function by reorganizing itself to compensate for brain atrophy and lesions. It reroutes communication pathways to avoid damaged areas and adapts undamaged areas to take on functions of areas affected by disease. This really is pretty fantastic, but unfortunately, it just can't keep pace with disease activity. Eventually, neurological reserve is exhausted and cognitive deficits become apparent. But that's not the end of the story. Neurological reserve has two components. Brain reserve, which refers to the size of the brain, and cognitive reserve, which is the ability to actively compensate and to make more effective and efficient use of brain networks. Our lifetime experiences can increase cognitive reserve and help to maintain brain reserves. This gives us a better chance to hang on to cognitive function if life throws us a curveball in the shape of a disease or All other things being equal, people with multiple sclerosis with high cognitive reserve lose less cognitive function than those with less cognitive reserve for the same amount of brain pathology. So, give your brain a helping hand by maximizing your brain health. It's like giving your neurological reserves a new lease. So, as I said, there's loads more of those animations available on my uh, website. I want to very briefly tell you about the Bronx Healthy Aging Study. Um, now, the reason I want to tell you about this is because earlier on when I mentioned the risk factors, I mentioned that low levels of education increase risk for developing dementia in later life. And that was really rather con con concerning when, when that was discovered first because you know, then there's a real sense of if you finish school early, um, you have an increased risk for developing dementia and what can you do about that? But we also know that engaging in stimulating activities um, is also protective. So these researchers wanted to understand um, how those two factors um, interacted. So they followed 488 um, healthy older adults, they were over about 75 at the time of the, the, the study, and they followed them for five years. Over the course of that five years, 101 of the cohort went on to develop dementia. Now, what they were looking at in this study was to see whether engaging in these stimulating activities, and you can see from the list there that none of them are, I mean, they're what I would call um, hobbies, you know, things that we like to do, reading, writing, crossword puzzles, etc. And essentially, you know, they were looking at the dose response in a way. So they were looking at, um, you know, engaging in one of these activities for one day per week. They were interested to find out what impact that had on in the group who went on to develop dementia. And they found out that engaging in one activity for one day per week in the individuals who had developed um, Alzheimer's disease, that that delayed the onset of memory loss for two months. So that's a great payoff. Um, and the really, really exciting thing was that that benefit, that positive effect was independent of education level. So those individuals gained that benefit um, from what the stimulating activities that they were engaging in in the here and now. And that was in individuals who already had um, dementia. So the, the take home message there really is it is never too late. Uh, to engage in stimulating activities. The second concept that I just wanted to introduce to you is neuroplasticity. And forgive me if lots of you are already familiar with that. Normally I can judge um, in the audience, but I can't see anyone's faces at the moment, but I'm taking it that people um, aren't familiar with it. Um, so our brain is flexible. 
it's adaptable, it can change and reorganize itself um, by growing new connections between neurons. And it does this at three key points in our lives. Um, at the beginning of life, uh, when the immature brain organizes itself. So as humans, we're born and, and with quite an incomplete brain, there's an awful lot of work has to be done in early years. And that's why it's really, really important to stimulate the brains of babies, infants when we have them. It scares me when I see infants in restaurants looking at, uh, you know, looking at laptops, etc. cetera, that, um, you know, the thing is uh, they need constant stimulation because if their, their brain cells aren't engaged, um, you know, they will be pruned out. Anyway, um, a lot of um, that happens during um, uh, just after we're born when the immature brain organizes itself. Second time it happens really is in response to brain injury when the brain itself tries to compensate for lost function and maximize remaining function. Um, and then the third time that it happens is in adulthood, when anything new is learned or memorized. So essentially, this term neuroplasticity just refers to the brain's capacity, the brain's ability to change with learning. So I'm going to show you a brief little animation that I made um, about things that you can do to keep your brain healthy. And then I'll move on and talk in more detail um, about things that you can do. Um, Okay, I'll play this now. What can you do to keep your brain healthy? We all know high cholesterol isn't good for our bodies, along with high blood pressure and being overweight. But what you might not know is that not only can these health concerns shorten the life of your body, they can affect your brain function. The more scientists study our brains, the more they're finding that how well it works is intricately tied to the health of our body. For example, just 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times a week can keep your brain sharp. Because physical exercise not only helps your heart, it can increase the size of your hippocampus, a part of the brain crucial to making memories. But that's not all. Physical exercise generates a chemical called EDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which acts like fertilizer for the brain, encouraging the growth of neural connections and new brain cells. So, obviously staying active is important, but not just physically active. You need to keep socially active as well, especially as you get older because there's growing evidence to suggest that people who can avoid getting lonely reduce their risk of cognitive decline, something we all agree is a good thing. There's one last thing you need to do to keep your brain healthy. Keep it active. So, in no particular order, here are three top ways to keep your brain stimulated. Number one, challenge yourself. The satisfaction you get from doing things slightly beyond your comfort zone actually changes your brain chemistry, making you feel more positive. Number two, change yourself. Novelty helps your brain, so it's good to experience new things, take on new situations and meet new people. And number three, learn something new. This encourages the growth of new brain cells and stimulates the connections between them, which has its own benefits because stronger brain connections also help keep your brain healthy. So don't let age stop you from doing the things you love. Think young, because if you look after your brain now, keeping it active and engaged, it will make you proud for years to come. Okay, so, oops, sorry, chopping my head off there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so uh, yeah, I like to, I call these my brain health hacks, and I like to divide them into three groupings, um, activity, attitude, and lifestyle. Um, so uh, let's start with um, activity. So physical exercise is actually one of the best things that you can do for your brain. Your brain needs um, a, a, a constant supply of nutrients and oxygen. Um, so physical activity actually has a direct benefit on both the brain structure 
and brain function. And of course, physical inactivity is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which if you remember from my very first slide there is, you know, a lot of cardiovascular uh, related diseases increase your risk of developing dementia. Um, physical exercise also releases hormones that create a nourishing environment that allow and, and support the growth of new brain cells. And they also stimulate neuroplasticity, um, increasing the growth factors, making it easier for um, your brain to grow new connections. And really when it becomes, comes to a healthy brain, um, brain health, what, what you want is, is, is more connections, more brain cells. Because when I talk about that resilience and that resistance to disease, it's not so much about how much disease or pathology you have in the brain, it's about how much healthy brain you have. So those individuals that I talked about earlier in that study in 1989 who had the disease but no symptoms, they had more healthy brain. Ultimately, had they lived long enough, they would have more and more pathology and eventually they would reach um, a critical point where their healthy brain can no longer cope with the amount of pathology in their brain and then symptoms would manifest. So if you can imagine, you have two individuals, one with high reserve and one with low reserve, and they both get the disease in their brain at the same time. The individual with low reserve will gradually, gradually, gradually start to show um, a decline in their functioning very gradually over time. Um, and they will probably get a diagnosis quite early in the disease. This individual here who has high reserve um, has more healthy brain to cope with the pathology and they can continue functioning um, you know, without any perceptible symptoms for quite a long time. Now, if those individuals um, continue to live on longer, eventually this individual with high reserve reaches a threshold point where the healthy brain can't cope with the amount of Pathology. And actually what happens is they have a precipitous drop and they join this individual. But the, the point being that they've had all this extra time um, able to function and live independently in the community, which is what most of us want to be able to do. So physical exercise is um, associated with better cognitive function, with increased activity in brain cells associated with attention. And that's really important because attention really is the first step in the memory making process. So because of that, it might actually improve your day-to-day -day memory. But physical exercise, as a lot of you probably already know, is associated with reduced levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. And they're three things that aren't really very good for your, for your brain health. So it's good for your Physical exercise is good for your brain health um, because it's good for your mental health as well. So um, really what I just want to say in terms of COVID um, is that even if you are on lockdown or, or, or restricted, you've got to find some way uh, to be physically active and to try and, try and do it every day. Um, if not, to uh, burn off the, cal the extra calories that we're all eating <laughs> while we're in the house. Um, but just to keep your brain healthy too and to keep your, keep your mental health um, you know, in good shape. Staying social is absolutely critical. If you recall earlier on, I said to you that loneliness um, increases our risk of developing um, uh, dementia in later life. Um, we're social creatures and we need social contact. And in fact, social engagement is quite a complex activity and it requires um, you know, us to, to challenge our brain, which is really good, um, which is really, really good for your, for your brain health uh, and promotes neuroplasticity. Because if you think about it, when you're talking to someone, it's quite complex. You're listening to what they're saying. You're trying to understand what they're saying. You're making a judgment about it. Do you believe them? Do you not believe them? Are they talking nonsense? And then at the same time, you're also formulating your response. And you may even also be holding a drink and a canapé in the other hand, you know? So it really is quite a complex social interaction. So we're missing that at the moment, um, and that's why it's critical that we find ways to stay socially connected. People with more social ties live longer, they have better health, they're less depressed, and they're less likely to develop cognitive impairment. Loneliness and social isolation in terms of detriment to our health, not just risk of Alzheimer's disease, are similar to smoking and obesity. Just 10 minutes social interaction can increase your brain performance. And it's rewarding, it makes you feel good. So it'll help to maintain your brain health and reduce your risk of dementia. Now, loneliness is quite literally a killer. And 
I, I, you saw at the start maybe that I have super brain up at the start of this, and that's the name of my podcast. And I actually did a special episode last week, you know, talking about loneliness. So if you're interested in what happens in your brain when you become lonely, you can check out that podcast. It's only about 10 minutes long, I think. Um, so loneliness really is a health issue, and I myself as, have actually spoken to uh, government ministers here in Ireland, um, and also I'm involved in the UK in Westminster, but that, you know, to, to understand that it is a health issue, and I, um, I think uh, something that will, it's really important we pay attention to during this COVID-19, um, during the measures, public health measures. Um, but in addition, loneliness is associated with increased susceptibility, susceptibility to infection and also increased levels of stress hormones and it interferes with your sleep and as a consequence then is associated with impaired immune function so in the midst of this pandemic we want a, you know our immune function to be working properly um, and we don't want to be susceptible to infection so maintaining social contact um, is absolutely critical because also if we become lonely and isolated we're more likely to engage in unhealthy behaviors such as overeating and drinking too much um, as a lot of us are actually noticing um, more than ever before so it's really critical to stay social and if you're working remotely from home make sure that you you know still have those water cooler moments during the day um, I said it to my own team you know if you're working apart from each other say well look at 10 o'clock we'll have a chat over zoom and at three o'clock we'll do it you've got to stay connected and um, i'm very concerned really about a lot of over 70s who are in forced isolation and um, who may not be online we can all use a lot of those and a lot of over 70s are online i'm, I'm not making that generalization uh, but there's lots of ways to stay connected online and um, but also um i made a little you know, slide video, you'll can find it on my social media, um, giving some tips for how people over 70 can stay connected. And I would just love if you went onto my social media, had a look at them and just share them with anybody that you know over 70, to let them know that they can still connect with people in person, but from a safe distance. So they could stand at their hall door and talk to passers-by or from their window, but it's important to stay connected. And also there's other ways, by phone. And, and, and a little tip for older people is sometimes hearing is a difficulty on the phone. So if they get on the phone early in the day, your hearing is better earlier in the day. And also if any of you know some, you can, you, you can order amplified phones so that they can hear better on phone. Uh, but we should all start getting connected by post, writing letters. Um, and then also I do find listening to podcasts, even if you are lonely, you know, you you kind of feel enveloped in it and, and you feel like you're part of a conversation even if you're just the quiet one sitting listening to the others talking and um, if you do feel lonely reach out ask there's so many places ways organizations to get you connected um, and also you could volunteer there's a lot of organizations who are looking to for people to be phone buddies and um, for people who are really really um, struggling during these uh, coronavirus um, measures Go mental, by that I just mean it's absolutely critical to, to keep challenging your brain. Learning, as I said, generates new brain cells and it enriches the networks opening up in your brain, opening up new routes that your brain can use to bypass damage. So I like to use this a very simple analogy, but I don't know the age of any of you watching this, but I don't know if you remember a cartoon um, called uh, Wiley Roadrunner, Wiley Coyote, I think it was. Me, me, me. They used to just run around these canyons chasing each other. And that was all the cartoon was. Um, but if you recall, uh, when I, I can't remember which one it was, but they'd run along and this boulder would come down and he'd run straight into the boulder and go splash. Now, I just like to take that as an analogy, that boulder as a piece of disease or pathology if we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. So if you just have one connection, say you're trying to get find the word for something and there's just one route through it, if that boulder, that piece of disease falls in front of it, you can't get past it and so you'll start to show symptoms. If you keep challenging your brain and learning new things and growing new connections, you've got another route. So you can take another road around the canyon. It might take you longer to get there, but you'll get there in the end. So the more connections you have, the better you can continue to function. It's a very simple way to explain it, but you know what? It works for me. <laughs> So um, the key in terms of um, your brain health really is 
that you must, if you're, if you're engaging, if you want to, to uh, stimulate your brain, a lot of people say to me, oh, I do the crossword, I do Sudoku, great, if you enjoy it. But unless it challenges you, you're not getting those new connections. So if you do the crossword, in order to, to, to get those new connections, you need to push yourself to the next level. You need to do the more complex crossword or put a timer on it. If you did it in 30 minutes, try to do it in 23, 25 minutes the next time or whatever. So in order to get the brain health benefits, you've got to challenge yourself you've got to involve learning it's got to involve learning and novelty newness it doesn't have to be academic so if you play a musical instrument um you know set yourself a challenge to learn a new technique or a new piece that maybe you think is beyond your your capabilities or take up carpentry or you know anything that involves learning it can even be as simple as try new food you know try a different flavors or, or um, you know, uh, gosh, it, it, it can be, you know, listen to a different genre of music. So if you constantly listen to pop music, your brain doesn't have to put any work in it. It, it, it can do it on autopilot. It knows the language. It knows there's a verse, verse, a chorus, and then there might be a bridge or whatever. If you challenge it by giving it some bluegrass music or jazz to listen to, go, oh, hold on. What's the language here? What's the pattern? I don't know what that is. So it has to work and it has to learn and you'll get new connections. So lifelong learning and education, I'm absolutely passionate about them. It can be, but I mean our education in the true sense of the word. I think when going to school and how we learn can turn us off education that, that make them sound like negative words and they're not the joy of it. I mean, I didn't go to university until I was 42. I left school at 16. I did an undergrad degree um, uh, in psychology, and then I got a scholarship to do my PhD in, in Trinity College um, uh, in the Institute of Neuroscience. Um, and I loved every minute of, of, of being, and so I, you know, challenging my brain all the time. And I mean, I know a lot of you, are, are, you know, have already been to university. For those who are listening in or watching who haven't ever been, I can highly recommend it if you're already, you know, you know, I hate to use the word middle age, but older or whatever, um, go for it. Don't be worried about it. I was terrified when I went to university, all these uh, young things who got like hundreds and hundreds of points um, in their leaving cert. And what I will tell you is that if you've already lived life, raised kids, had a mortgage, uh, dealt with life's challenges, an undergrad degree is nothing. Honest to goodness, it really isn't. If you work hard, apply yourself and pick a subject that you love, that's the key. Honestly, you will just, it will be a joy. You'll, you'll experience the true joy of, of learning. So uh, it's good for your brain health. Um, anything, anything that you can do to build those reserves, and particularly now while we're isolated, because we're at risk of boredom and an under-stimulated brain. Your brain is a high energy organ. It weighs only 2% of your body, but it consumes about 25% of the nutrients that you take in at any one time. So it has to be really efficient. And if use it or lose it applies, it cannot afford to waste energy on um, brain cells that aren't being used. So if you allow, allow things go fallow during um, social isolation, the self-isolating, you will lose brain function and volume. So keep stretching it, challenging yourself. Online courses, there's amazing stuff. Look at your bucket list. Is there anything that you could do from your bucket list? Or even childhood dreams. You know, I mean, I'm not saying you have to do wonderful stuff. I know being isolated can be challenging. I'm writing a book at the moment, um, and I have a deadline for the 30th of April. And, you know, the first couple of weeks, I couldn't get a word on paper. But now we're kind of getting into, we're starting to adapt. So start to revisit and see whether you can take on um, new challenges. Um, love your heart. So your heart is really just a pump that services your brain. Uh, I don't need to go into detail about how you can look after your heart health, um, but it really is critical that you do because your brain is totally dependent on your heart to give it oxygen and nutrients. So exercise, maintain a healthy weight, a balanced diet, and look after your blood pressure is really, really important. Um, what kind of diet is good for your brain? A Mediterranean diet is the one that has the, uh, the most... 
um, evidence um, for, for, you know, for being good for your brain. Um, fresh ingredients. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of people panic buying at the start of this COVID and they were all buying these preserved foods. Fresh ingredients. Avoid the preservatives, the added sugars, the added salt. Cook from scratch. We have more time now to do that. And it's actually easier and quicker. Um, uh, so I have some, a video online um, that actually also explains why high blood pressure is bad for your brain. So choosing balance in life is critical. Your brain thrives on regularity and um, it needs to know when it's going to get sleep, when it's going to get food, etc. And we make life really hard for it because we live really irregular lives. Um, if you want your brain, you know, if you want it to operate to its optimum, well then um, do things regularly. Um, uh, on also in a broader sense in your life, all work and no play is not good, but all play and no work is not good for your brain either. We spend a lot of time on technology. We've got to try and balance that with nature. We're still very lucky where we are here in Ireland. We're still able to get out walking. I'm fortunate in that I live near the sea, so I can still see that. But try and connect somehow, whatever way you can uh, at the moment. And also balance water with alcohol if you are going to be drinking it. Sleep is absolutely critical for brain health. When you go to sleep at night, your brain has a job of work to do. And that job is involved, actually involves consolidating memories um, and the new things that you've taken in uh, during the day. So at the early part of the night when you take information in, it's filtered first and then we see activity, electrical activity, where it's bed embedding that information across your brain. Then in the later part of the night, what I would call early morning, what we actually see is activity where the new information that you've taken in is being integrated with all your existing memories and information. And that happens during when you have more REM sleep, the dream sleep. And that's why you often have those really strange dreams where you've a bit of something from today mixed in with something from your past. And you know, if you want to have more insight and ideas and be more creative, make sure that you're getting sufficient um, sleep because that really is where they come from. You can wake after a good night's sleep with a solution to a problem. But also when you sleep at night, your brain has to clear out the toxins and the byproducts of metabolism. It can't do that during the day. Um, whilst it's also being you. It can clean a little bit out, but it can't do a deep clean. So you need really good solid sleep, sleep to clear out those toxins. And some of those toxins are implicated in Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid. In addition, it, you know, poor sleep will lower your immune function and you have a, a, you know, a, a link in with stress. So tips on how to uh, look after sleep. It's the regularity thing. Get up and go to bed at the same time every day, even at the weekends. Your brain doesn't really care whether it's the weekend or not. Physical activity is brilliant for inducing street sleep. Managing stress, I'll be talking about that in a, in, in, in a moment. Try and have some downtime before bed and lower the lights in the evening time. You know, try and play with what uh, circadian rhythms, you know, um, try and stop with the technology for about an hour before bed. Um, you can see a few more there that you probably already know about caffeine and, and eating lightly, um, etc. Um, so then attitude is really, really important. Uh, managing stress is um, critical. Um, because I have to say, first of all, stress is not inherently bad. And if you want to rise to the challenges that are so good for your brain, you need to evoke the, the stress response. You know, you, you need that to attain your goals um, uh, and actually, you know, motivation. So, so it's nothing wrong with an appropriate stress response. When it becomes problematic is when it's poorly managed and chronic. Um, and when that happens, um, oops, uh, okay, I just noticed time. I'm going to have to really hurry up. So basically, um, poorly managed chronic stress can impact on the structure and function of the part of your brain, the hippocampus, that's involved in learning and memory. So it can in impair that, but it also can reduce your immune function and set the stage for depression. So it's all about finding your own stress sweet spot. These slides are going to be, uh, come up afterwards, so you can come and have a look at them um, and you'll see some tips. But being realistic is important. And what I just want to say here in terms of COVID, I put up uh, another Superbrain uh, podcast about managing stress speci specifically. But I would say, you know, avoid being on social media too much. 
Um, and you don't need news on the hour, every hour of, around COVID. And I have special tips on that on my podcast. Um, be present in the moment. A lot of us are worrying um, about what's going to happen after COVID or, you know, things that have already happened. And we're not living in the moment. Living in the moment um, will help us through this crisis. Um, focusing on what you're doing while you're doing it. It's a natural antidote to stress. Um, and um, it also will keep those negative thoughts and anxieties at bay. Um, I'm coming to my final, this is my final um, tip, it's to keep smiling. Um, it's free, it actually boosts the growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus, which is responsible for learning and memory. It makes your brain more resilient and it, it releases feel-good hormones. It boosts immune function, yes, it boosts immune function, which we really need now. It lowers your blood pressure and it protects against stress, anxiety and depression. The simple act of smiling makes you feel happy even if you're not. So it really is a case of fake it till you make it. You release all those good benefits when you smile. A lot of us, you know, feel, gosh, there's so much awful stuff going on in the moment and so much death around us that it seems inappropriate to laugh and to smile. But we must do. We must manage that stress. And laughter is nature's natural stress buster. It actually lowers cholesterol levels. So get yourself a pile of funny movies, funny podcasts, whatever makes you laugh. Have it on at the ready when you start to feel that anxiety and stress rising that a lot of us are feeling um, when we listen to, them, to, 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 the, to the news. Um, uh, be aware of the negativity bias. As humans, we're heightened to negativity. So you need five positives to counteract every negative. So the next time you have a negative thought, tell yourself you're not allowed to have another one until you've thought of five positive things in between. And then I'm going to finally leave you with my tip, and that is to smile at least five times a day. Smile first thing in the morning because it is a great way to start the day. Smile last thing at night because it's good to end the day on a positive note. I would ask you to see whether you can share that smile with someone else, whether it's virtually online with colleagues at work or somebody from your window wave out smile because then you're spreading the health benefits and you can do whatever you want with the other two smiles. Um, I'm going to leave you now uh, with uh, information about, that's my podcast. I have a book called 100 Days to a Younger Brain. You can build your own unique, um, your brain is unique. I've, and, and basically really what this book will help you do is see the current state of your brain health, what you're doing right, what needs fixing, um, so that you can set your own personal goals and build your own bespoke brain health plan. This um, is information you'll find on my website, superbrain.ie. You'll find all my social media links, links to uh, my book and my podcast, but also here, I don't know if you can see yet, here are links to all the different resources. Hello Brain is a full website with tips on brain health. This is a free brain health app, um, lots of videos and tips, and they're all free and available to you. Sorry if I went over. Um, I hope there's people still there. <laughs> That's great, Sabina. Thank you so much. That's been really incredible to hear your presentation. Um, there are a number of questions that have come through. I think we have time to uh, answer a few of those. Um, the first one here is, in the Bronx study, did that delay experienced by individuals who engaged in stimulating activities scale if they engage more, than, more often than once a week? Yes. Yes. It's the straight okay. answer, yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question here. Could you please comment on multilingualism and dementia? Um, uh, I'm not really sure now how, how, how to comment. Yes, there are certain links um, in terms that it may well be protective. Um, it is uh, not my own area of speciality, so probably that's as far as I can comment on it um, in that regard, really, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, have you come across any links between pituitary conditions like growth hormone deficiency and brain health? Well, um, hormones are chemical messengers 
uh, and, and that's how your brain communicates. So balanced hormones, and it's not just ones from the pituitary gland. I mean, you know, a lot of us will, um, if you take your sex hormones, um, particularly for women, when they change uh, menopause or post-pregnancy or even through the ovulatory cycle, they can actually impact on cognitive function. So can thyroid thyroid um, hormones um, can impact. So yes, I mean, really when it comes to your body, it's about when anything goes out of balance, um, it can impact on your brain. The thing is with receptors for hormones as well, whilst they might appear to have a particular function, you have receptors everywhere for them, you know, and, and, and in the brain too. So um, uh, yes, I, I guess the sort of the answer really to say there is when anything, any hormones go out of balance, there is potential for it to impact on your brain function. Okay. Um, there was somebody here who was asking if uh, they could download the slides. And what I was going to say there is we are recording um, this presentation and we can provide you with that link so you would have an opportunity to um, see these slides afterwards and share those. I think you were mentioning that you were... Um, in a um, nursing community and I wanted to, and there was a notice board uh, with the, within the older person's complex that you're in and that there was a notice board where you wanted to share these. Would that be right, Sabina? Sorry, say that again? That um, th this will be available as a recording, but we won't be able to make the, uh, the presentation. Not the, not the slides, but the, yeah. to be honest, if you go to all those free resources, there's just so much in there um, in terms of the videos, et cetera. Um, uh, if that, it, yeah, I mean, I actually have tons of DVDs as well. Um, if people, you know, wanted to, to collect some of them for, for nursing homes or something like that, um, they're, they're, they're more than welcome. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, the resources and, and if they have them, they can share them. You know, nursing homes have lots of TVs as well. You know, they can just, should be able to play them on smart TVs, the, the free resources. Fantastic. Um, another question, what advice would you give to teachers to help them support their students' brain health at the moment? Oh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, and, and the, the funny thing is when I, when I, you know, was first meeting the publisher of my, of my, of my first book and they said, well, you know, who's this book aimed at? Like, who would be? And I kind of went, well, it's for everyone with a brain. And, and the thing is, brain health is for everyone with a brain. And the earlier we start, the better. So I would think in terms of, uh, you know, advising kids about their brain health. Um, and I do think this really applies to students as well when they're studying for exams outside of COVID, etc. cetera. Um, physical exercise is critical for your brain health and really rather than pushing through and, and you know trying to study for six hours on the trot you would be far better breaking it up and going for a run and in fact there's research to, to show this going for a run and then coming back and you actually will be able to take more in and study better similarly scrimping on sleep is not good and um, because the thing is um, if you haven't had enough sleep the night before you haven't cleared out the temporary repository of the information you took in yesterday, so you actually can't take in any more information. And if you don't get, a, even if you've had a good day and you've learned stuff, if you don't get enough sleep at night time, that new information won't be consolidated as memory. So sleep is critical. Um, I would tell them to, you know, spend a little less time on the, the you know, the light emitting devices, particularly before going to bed at night. Um, because the blue light uh, wakes them up. Um, to try and manage uh, their stress, often people forget that kids can get stressed and depressed and anxious just like the rest of us. Um, I think at the moment, the biggest tip around um, the COVID-19 is acceptance. There's not a lot we can do about these things at the moment. There's a lot that um, is out of our control, but what we can do is control how we respond to them. And one way to do that is to really just start living life in the moment um, and getting on with things that make you feel good and things that you can achieve and not be thinking too far forward and not be saying, oh, I hope we're out of here on the 5th of May, you know, because then oh, it just builds and builds and builds. Just try and focus um, on the here and now. Okay, um, just a few more questions here. 
uh, what are your thoughts on supplements like omega-3 fish oils? Okay, so there's actually, um, there was a study done in the US around all the various supplements. There's a lot of people that are um, selling supplements on the basis that they will boost your memory function. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no research that shows any singular, you know, outstanding vitamin, nutrient that you can take that boosts your brain health. You've got to really think of an overall diet that gives you um, the nutrients that you need. And a Mediterranean diet is pretty good in that regard. We do need omega-3, but from your diet um, is enough unless you have been diagnosed. Vitamin B12 is very important for brain health, but unless you've been diagnosed as being... Um, deficient, you don't need to be taking the supplements. So my advice, and, and from that, basically, there was a large, um, large piece of research done very recently in the US um, looking at all the supplements. And where it stands at the moment is there is no evidence base to say that you should be taking any of these supplements and that they actually will benefit in a particular way far better to go with these things that don't cost money, that we know do benefit your brain health. Because there isn't one thing that I have suggested this evening that costs a penny. You know, it really is just about a healthy life. So a balanced diet is, is, is critical and as close, to, um, as close to its natural form as possible, you know. And, and actually, I'm finding that I have a bit more time to, you know, because I'm at home and, and cooking and, you know, kind of batch making soups with loads and loads of vegetables mm -hmm. and it's really actually quite easy um, and sometimes the stuff is cooked quicker than it would be with these ones that come in plastic and you have to stick in the oven for 45 minutes so avoiding the preservatives and additives and and a healthy balanced diet it really is all about balance in a way that's a great point yeah uh, just two more questions here um, what would you find between hereditary traits and Alzheimer's. Okay, so good question. Um, so um, there is, um, there's a couple of things there. So my own mother had dementia. Um, so I do understand people's, you know, kind of concerns in that regard. There is a genetic element, but it is neither necessary nor sufficient. So that means that some people who get Alzheimer's disease don't have it. And some people who do ha have Alzheimer's disease don't have it. Did I say that the right way around? Anyway. Um, <laughs> so basically, yes, there is a certain genetic element, but the risk associated that with that is small compared to the risk associated with the lifestyle factors that I mentioned there. So even if you do have that genetic risk factor, if, you know, living a brain healthy lifestyle should help in the same way as it does for everybody else. And also what I'm saying here as well, those tips, etc., that I've spoken about and that I speak at length about in my book, um, they're also perfectly good for somebody who already has or is already experiencing memory decline or may already have a diagnosis of dementia. You know, people living with dementia should be challenging their brains. We have a habit of doing for instead of doing with. And so we deprive people with dementia of um, actually looking after themselves and doing things that would help to keep their brains um, active for a bit longer. So encourage them to, to, to do things. Great. Was there a um, second part to that question? No, no, that was it. Um, there was uh, just a final question here, um, and then we can, we can uh, close off. Um, and I think you have answered this uh, really during your presentation, but there was somebody here who was asking if you could comment on the interaction between the increased uncertainty and the times that we're experiencing now and maintaining brain health. So, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that, that, that the uncertainty underlies anxiety and stress and the loss of control. Our whole world has shifted and changed. Um, and, and, you know, we, we all feel it. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can get a rushes, rushes of anxiety. I'm having anxiety dreams. And I actually had to do a piece, a public health piece, um, actually about loneliness on TV here um, recently. And it was the first time I had a letter to say I could travel because, you know, the HSE wanted, you know, someone to talk about it on television. And it's the first time I left the house because I don't do the shopping. And I mean, I had left the house to, to do exercise, but just in my own area. But I went to the train station and I, and I could just feel this rush of anxiety. So I think that's actually something we're going to have to watch when we do get back to, to normality. I think it's perfectly natural to feel that, 
But I think it's critical, absolutely critical, that we manage it and get it under control. Um, because what I do say in the podcast, I've done a podcast, How to Manage Stress During COVID-19. Super Brain is the name of my podcast, and you'll find it wherever you get your podcast. But um, the thing is, if you don't manage to get it under control, what happens is neuroplasticity increases in your amygdala, which is your fear center. So your fear center starts to get bigger, and neuroplasticity is suppressed in your frontal lobes, your thinking brain. So normally your thinking brain can override your immediate stress response and say, calm down, there's no need, let's switch off, the threat has passed or there's nothing we can do about it, let's switch off the cortisol. But if you're prolonged stress, uh, this part of your brain starts to shrink and, and the, the amygdala, which is right in the center sort of, starts to get bigger. So the longer you're stressed, the more fearful you become and you start to seeing start seeing threat and fear everywhere and um, so it's so important to start if you're already in that space you really really have to actively start working and saying okay it's just that my amygdala is on overdrive i need to start connecting this rational part of my brain and even some simple steps like saying i'm only going to worry at two o'clock during the day from 2 to 2.30 2 is my worry time. No, it's funny, but it, those kind of things can actually work. And then if it comes to you at 4 o'clock, you say, no, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Great. Oh, that's great. What a fantastic uh, ending um, for this evening's presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen really quickly here. Um, and uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Ali, are you able to pop over the spotlight onto the screen here? Um, a really big thank you to, um, to Sabina for being a part of our first ever Inspiring Ideas um, at Trinity webinar. That was such a fantastic presentation. There was so much information there for all of us to take away. So thank you again. Um, again, as you've said, all of the information that you provided tonight, um, information on your podcasts, um, books, uh, research, and so on, you can find at uh, superbrain.ie. If uh, any of you have questions or comments regarding this webinar series or any other questions you'd like to ask uh, of us here at Trinity Development and Alumni, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Um, next week, we are excited to uh, bring in Dr. Brendan Kelly, who is the author of Coping with Coronavirus, and he will be speaking on how to stay calm and protect your mental health. That's gonna be at 1 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday. Um, we want to thank all of the team that has been behind the scenes making this happen this evening. Uh, we couldn't have been able to do it without you. And I also wanted to thank the alumni community and friends who have mobilized to support students during this really stressful time. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we launched a student hardship fund, which is here to support students during the COVID-19 crisis that are going to need some financial support. Uh, we've already been able to raise over 200,000 euros um, as part of this fund. So if it's something that you're interested in learning more about, you can go to alumni at tcd.ie or um, for, the, um, for the donation page, it is at tcd.ie uh, slash campaign slash donate. Thank you again so much for being with us this evening. We look forward to welcoming you next week uh, for our next uh, webinar. And in the meantime, please stay safe. Thank you very much.